Welcome to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler, and I have a distinguished group of people with me today, and we will be talking about uh, the, the war in Ukraine and how it started and where we are today. My guests include Joe Lombardo from neighborhood uh, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, uh, Scott Ritter, and Dr. Peter Cookson. So, uh, whoever would like to start and talk about how, the history of Ukraine and, you know, the importance of, of knowing what happened in the past. So, the floor is yours, guys. Screen, look at the screen. Well, I'll, I'll just go real quick um, because I, I, I've, I've studied this uh, more as a hobby than a uh, than, than a um, than a profession, but um, you know one of the main uh, military objectives of Russia and its campaign against uh, targeting Ukraine is denazification, and I think we we would be remiss if we didn't focus on this aspect of uh, of the conflict. Um, denazification uh, specifically targets um, an ideology of Ukrainian nationalism linked to an individual named Stepan Bandera. Uh, a Ukrainian nationalist who was active in the 1930s, 1940s, um, fighting first uh, against uh, Soviet occupation of Ukraine, uh, and then uh, fighting with Nazi Germany against the Soviets during World War II. Um, some people say, well, what's wrong with fighting the Soviets? I mean, you know, communism, uh, let's go for it. No, Ukrainian nationalism, uh, as practiced by Stepan Bandera, is every bit as virulent and uh, odious as, uh, as Nazi ideology that was practiced by Adolf Hitler. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about um, the the the, uh, the, uh, the murder of the um, the the Jews at uh, Babi Yar in Kiev, 1941. Uh, over 30,000 people gunned down. Uh, the Germans may have directed it, but it was Stepan Bandera's triggerman who pulled the trigger. Uh, they murdered, um, you know, hundreds of thousands of Jews uh, during a resistance from 1944 to 1954, which was funded, by the way, by the Central Intelligence Agency. Um, they murdered over 100,000 Poles, and over 200,000 Russian, uh, ethnic Russians, in an effort to create this ethnically pure uh, Western Ukrainian homeland. They failed. Uh, it cost the Soviets around 40,000 troops, but. You know, after that, uh, from 1955 till 1990, the CIA funded this ideology, kept it alive politically, and today it's live in a well. You know, they have a military unit called the Azov Regiment. Uh, people say, well, that's just a small unit that was brought into the Ukrainian army in 2014. Don't overreact. Really? If the United States allowed the Ku Klux Klan to take its various militias and form them into battalions and then incorporate them intact into the United States Army, wouldn't that make the U.S. Army a racist organization? And wouldn't it make the United States of America a racist nation because we facilitate this? That's exactly what the Ukrainians have done, and people shouldn't forget it. 20, 23 to 32 million Russians died, Soviet citizens died during World War II at the hands of Nazi Germany, and Russia will be loath to let that odious ideology resurrect its ugly head next door in Ukraine. Joe? Yeah, maybe I'll just say a couple of things. Um, I think the denazification is one of the reasons that the, the Russians went in. Uh, there's others. Uh, the U.S. had made promises to uh, Russia that it would not move NATO east of Germany, closer to the Russian border in the uh, early 1990s when uh, the Soviet Union was dissolving. And since that time, they've moved it into 14 uh, country, of those countries. And now they want to move it into Ukraine, which has a, lo a very long border with uh, Russia. And it would mean that if the US brought nuclear capable missiles to that border, as they have to others of these 14 countries, uh, they would be minutes from Moscow. And that's just a security risk that uh, um, Russia said they uh, can cannot, uh, they don't want to deal with. We've also held uh, military exercises right on those borders, but especially if Ukraine had nuclear capable missiles and there were these Nazis in their military who um, want to destroy Russia and want to destroy Russians, 
that makes it a much bigger risk. And the Nazis and the Nazi factions and the nationalists in Ukraine are not a small group of, uh, of people. Um, uh, 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 on the UNAC website, United National Anti-War Coalition, which is the national organization that I am the uh, coordinator of, if you go there, unacpeace.org, and just scroll down, I think, to the third article on that homepage, you'll see a video that was uh, done by people that I know who were anti-Maidan Ukrainians. In other words, people that were against the US-sponsored coup in 1914 um, on the growth of Nazism in uh, Ukraine. And you'll see the marches and you'll see the, the attacks on Jewish cemeteries and synagogues and you'll, you'll see some of the uh, stuff that uh, um, the whole world should be fearful. Um, some people thought the, uh, the Nazis in Germany were not something to care about and the left kind of ignored them because they were only 30 percent and uh, you know when they in their last election and they had this funny little man with a mustache but we see the consequences of ignoring um, Nazis so uh, I'd encourage people to go and, and take a look at that Additionally, white supremacists and um, real right-wing nationalists and Nazis from around the world have joined the Azov Brigade from many, many different countries. Um, if they survive this war and go back to their country with military training, weapons training, um, uh, what will that mean for the many countries around the world? It's probably very similar to what the US did with Al Qaeda when we helped Al Qaeda fight um, the Russians in, in um, Afghanistan. Um, this Al Qaeda grew to a terrorist organization that terrorized the whole world. And the US is doing the same thing over and over again. It's doing the same thing in Ukraine and it should be stopped. Skara? Well, how about the, the other gentleman? <laughs> <laughs> yes, thank you. I'm listening to Scott and uh, Joe, and uh, you know, I'm scr scratching my head and saying, do I have anything significant to add to what these gentlemen have already put forward? And my sources, of course, are the mainstream media, and um, you know, I don't have a great historical uh, background in Ukraine um, uh, since we just started to contemplate this particular program here, I reached into some of my library and come up with some very interesting material that was published in 1985 in a journal of historical review that you may or may not be aware of. <clears throat> and uh, it, it talks uh, about the, uh, the most recent article that I read in 1985 uh, had to do with what the the Russians did in preparation for the invasion of the Germans into Russia. The invasion was not a surprise as far as uh, Stalin was concerned or of the Russians. They had already moved most of their factories or had prepared the movement of most of their factories from the eastern area of Russia into the uh, base of the Ural Mountains and so on. But uh, the uh, material that that Joe and Scott have put forward indicates that this, the only thing that I might add is, is to add is that the project for the new American century included encircling Russia uh, with lots of military bases. And as Joe points out, these bases were, uh, have been there and have been developed and, and are have potential for uh, nuclear warheads to be developed, or, I mean, to be delivered in, onto the, uh, the Russian homeland. And when a similar phenomenon occurred in Cuba back in 1962, um, you know, we went crazy in ballistic. Um, and we're doing exactly the same thing there. And also we're doing the same thing in, with China. Uh, I have a, a, an interest in uh, what the Chinese response to this is, and it's very measured and, and uh, um, I, I, I am puzzled because I have insufficient data to draw any conclusions as to where these people are ultimately going. Um, there aren't, there shouldn't, be any surprises as to the 
devastation that has been wreaked upon the um, the uh, Ukrainian people. Uh, this is a scor scorched war, a scorched war. Okay, uh, program that the Russians used in the Second World War, and uh, it's happening now in Ukraine. And uh, I asked myself this morning, what does Mr. Zelensky have to profit by allowing the Russians to destroy Ukraine? And that's a question. I don't have an answer for that. And perhaps Joe or Scott could address that or somebody else. So I think that's a very interesting question. What's your take, Joe or Scott? Go ahead, Joe. <laughs> well, uh, I, I think Zelensky isn't his own man. I mean, he was an actor and he was a comedian and um, uh, he was financed by one of the oligarchs that also finances the Azov Brigade. Um, and when he, he ran for office, I was actually in Ukraine when he was elected and spoke to some of the folks there of what they think. They didn't, the people that were anti-Maidan people that were the people I was with. I was in, in um, Odessa then as a, an international observer at the memorial for the people the Nazis killed at the House of Trade Unions. And they, they didn't have a lot of hope for him. But it was very clear that a lot of people in Ukraine um, did not like the Nazis and did not like the um, uh, anti-Russian um, attitude of the government and saw Zelensky as perhaps someone that would tamp that down. As soon as he was elected, we saw exactly the opposite. He kept the war going in Donbass and he, he um, uh, took a different position. I think he's totally controlled by the United States um, and they determine what they want. And the United States is willing to um, try to fight this war against Russia and draw down as draw as much blood from Russia as possible to the very last Ukrainian. You know, uh, that's the, the way they've been fighting wars recently. They've been proxy wars using, in Syria, for instance, they've used um, uh, about 100,000 jihadists that they imported into the country to fight that war. These are proxy wars because I don't think the American people would like to see a war in which there were a lot of troops dying, uh, American troops dying. And so they use these proxy wars. And this is another proxy war of the United States against Russia. Additionally, the United States hoped that they could destroy the economy of Russia through this, which is turning out exactly the opposite. It's the US and European economies that are really being hurt, although Russia is being hurt, but has prepared for this and is doing well, and the ruble is doing well. Um, and uh, so I don't think Zelensky is his own person. And I think the Ukraine as it existed before uh, February is not going to exist again. It's going to be a, a very, very uh, different place. And, and I don't think um, Zelensky has a lot of autonomy in what he says and what he does in this situation. Scott? No, I, I look, I, I agree 100%. Uh, Zelensky was a failed politician going into this war, 23%. Um, he had uh, arrested all of his political opposition, had shut down all the political uh, media. So anybody who uh, calls him this great uh, democratic leader simply doesn't know what reality is. And in order to survive, he had to go to bed with the, uh, with the Nazis, with the right wing, with the right sect, with the Azov battalion. And um, the, the, the end result is that this odious ideology has permeated itself throughout Ukraine um, to the extent that Russia you know, denazification could have been much easier had Zelensky separated himself from that. But Zelensky and the Ukrainian nation have become uh, identified with this uh, odious ideology, and I fear for the future of Ukraine. But you know, Ukraine is just the um, it's just the initial part of a larger puzzle of uh, of pushback from nations like Russia and China uh, against uh, American-led hegemony. Uh, the Russians have said that. Uh, the solution they're seeking in Ukraine, which ultimately will be a neutral Ukraine, is part and parcel of a restructuring of the European security framework, one that pushes back against the eastward expansion of NATO. And I bring this up because uh, one of the byproducts of Russia's move on, on Ukraine 
is that nations like Sweden and Finland now are considering joining NATO. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you define eastward expansion of NATO in a manner that threatens Russia by putting NATO on a very large border with Russia, other than say Finland. Um, and you know, Finland is is uh, is is playing with disaster here. Uh, what part of Russia doesn't bluff? Don't you understand? What part of Russia will not tolerate NATO expansion to its borders does Finland not understand? What part of the winter war and the war of continuation does Finland not understand? Finland is setting itself up to be the next Ukraine. And if people don't believe Russia is serious about this, then they don't know Russia. The other thing that's happening here uh, by going into Ukraine is that Russia has um, taken the, the wrappings off of the notion of war uh, it, that China is watching, uh, that, you know, Peter brought up uh, China. China has been hesitant about Taiwan because of concerns about how the world would react, about what the consequences of this action would be. Ukraine has removed all the mystery. We now know how the world would react, and we know that the world is impotent in the face of nations seeking to exert their strategic security interests on areas close to their borders. Taiwan has no friends. Taiwan has no allies. Taiwan has nobody who will come to their assistance. Taiwan is ripe for the picking. And China is increasing its rhetoric about what it wants to do with Taiwan to include saying that when we go against Taiwan, not if, we expect that it will be a war with the United States. And China's good with that. And I have to tell you, somebody who, it, you know, I'm, I'm not anti-war in that I would never fight a war, but I'm anti-war because I know that war is the most horrible thing in the world. Uh, we're looking at the prospects of continued conflict in Europe and new conflict in the Pacific. Uh, that um, if you think Ukraine was bad, this will be even worse. And it's all because the United States doesn't know how to peacefully coexist with the rest of the world. This is about pushback against American hegemony. And um, you know, people say, how do we solve this problem? You solve it here at home. By making sure our politicians don't embrace, you know, the, this 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 global domination uh, that that we do, it's it's troublesome to me. Peter, yes, the pro project for New American Century, formulated back in the 1990s, uh, began at least screamed at us on September 11th, 2001, and the subsequent uh, invasion of Afghanistan and followed by the invasion of Iraq. And by the way, the fact that we haven't found the, pro the uh, weapons of mass destruction doesn't mean that there weren't any, we just haven't found them yet. <laughs> and so as the factor that, um, that China's, uh, China's is the big player in town, that is the, the new game in town or the new player in town as uh, we've seen. And, um, and that's something that uh, I have been watching as best as I can uh, with the limited access that I have to media other than what we characterize as mainstream media. And I still have it lurking in the back of my mind and I'm, I'm looking for and reading the Tao and I'm reading Confucius say and trying to understand what is motivating them. And I, I'm not quite sure that, um, well, I think that the, the Chinese will come to the assistance of the Russians. And uh, and as I'm not sure that uh, I do know that Xi Jinping feels very strongly that he who fires the first shot has already lost the war. And I suspect that instead of a, a, a shooting war, at least at the outset, there will be an economic war. And among the things that uh, they can control very easily is the, uh, the chips chip manufacturer, for instance, which I think a lot of it is taking place in, in uh, uh, Taiwan. And, uh, you know, just look and see uh, on the label of the garments that uh, you pick up at Walmart or elsewhere, or uh, you'll see made in China and uh, lots of them. And an economic warfare would be an embargo on the United States. And that's been tried before. And we, and we the people have suffered greatly. 1973 is something screams at me. I remember that very well. Um, so that's what my expectation is, and I think that this is, you know, it's a proxy war. Um, what was the war in Afghanistan all about? And consider the possibility that uh, rare metals and rare earth metals are uh, in abundance in Afghanistan. Were, were the people of the United States or the PNAC uh, folks uh, aware of where the uh, uh, important raw materials for development of a uh, 
a, a militarized government or a militarized economy, where are they? Well, what happened in Bolivia when um, uh, Evo Morales was reelected? Well, the US moved in there very quickly and, and got rid of him and put somebody else in there. So because they knew very well what's in the bottom of Lake Pupo up on there on the Altiplano. So um, I think that the, the war that we're going to see is an economic war and um, China is going to be the, the new player in town and the big player in town. Joe, would you agree? Yeah, I think uh, China is the ultimate goal of the United States. It's the country that's challenging U.S. hegemony uh, right now. Um, its economy might have surpassed uh, the U.S. right now. It has uh, one fourth to one fifth of the world's population uh, in China. Its economy is growing at a rapid rate where ours is is not. And I think they thought if they could destroy Russia, they can further surround China, which they're already doing with bases and and uh, uh, naval uh, forces. Um, and uh, then they hope they would be able to uh, um, defeat and do regime change in China. But Russia is showing that they can't do that. And Russia took the bully and punched him in the nose. And the bully is not able to uh, do very much. Uh, China doesn't have to help militarily Russia right now. Russia is winning this. Russia is going exactly by, by its plan. And I think all the negotiations between um, uh, Russia and China at the Olympics and other times when the U.S. diplomatically boycotted the Olympics set all this up. They knew exactly what was going to happen. If uh, um, uh, Europeans uh, do not want the um, gas from Russia, which will be dis terribly destructive for their economy, especially Germany, which has an industrial economy, China is prepared to take it. Um, the sanctions against Russia have not been accepted around the world. None of the Latin American countries joined in those sanctions. None of the African countries joined in those sanctions. Only three Asian countries joined in those sanctions. The sanction war, which the US was hoping was the main war, is simply not working for the United States. And I think China is doing what it needs to do and playing a low key role, but clearly on, on, on the side uh, of Russia. And I think together, these countries see the new um, banking system and the new economic system moving to the east in their direction. And I think that's really what's happening. And that's why the United States is so desperate. And that's why I wonder about the United States doing very desperate actions. And I think that's the thing the world has to really fear right now. Desperate is a pretty strong word, though, Joe. Well, but I, I don't, the United States is not prepared to lose its world hegemony and to you to not have the dollar as the currency in which everybody does the trading in, which is the reason they were able to do these sanctions against uh, something like 42 countries now. And these countries have been getting together and figuring out ways around the sanctions. So their sanctions program doesn't really seem to even be working, being very effective against other countries like Venezuela or Nicaragua, um, you know, or Eritrea or, or any of these other countries. It, it's, it, it hurts them. It does hurt them, but they're working out ways around it. And uh, um, so uh, I think uh, China, the goal of the United States in this action was China. I think China is, is playing its hand very cool in the correct way. And uh, I think the United States is not going to be able to, uh, in Ukraine, defeat Russia in the way they would like, unless they do desperate actions like bringing in troops, using nuclear weapons, using chemical weapons, which we know there's chemical factories they've been putting up there and this kind of thing. And that would be terribly disastrous. And that's, that's something that all anti-war people need to oppose. Scott? Well, I mean, yeah, we, the whole world needs to oppose um, any, any potential of, of nuclear war. Um, and unfortunately, uh, when we speak of conflict between NATO and Russia, we're talking about a conflict that could very well end in not just a limited nuclear exchange, but a, a, a global nuclear exchange, which means it's all over. Anything we're talking about, anything we care about doesn't matter because we always see the 200,000 degree suntan and our life is finished. Um, and I don't mean to make light of it, but 
sometimes that's the only way you can uh, you can deal with issues of this uh, seriousness because otherwise you'd go insane. Um, I grew up in Germany in the 1980s. I lived next door to the largest nuclear weapons storage facility uh, in West Germany. And uh, if the if a war came, uh, it was common knowledge that um, this place would be hit with a nuclear weapon. And um, that meant that every day I woke up was a lucky day because that meant that the Russians didn't fire, hadn't fired a nuclear weapon, hadn't started a war. But my dad would go down the bunker sometimes for days, weeks at a time because tensions had gotten that high. So you went to school wondering if there'd be a home to come home to because a war meant the end of, 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 of human life. Um, in 1988, I had the, uh, the wonderful opportunity of participating in the uh, implementation, implementation of the Intermediate Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty, getting rid of entire categories of nuclear weapons and the missiles that carried them that threatened European and global security. That was a good deal. Then the United States withdrew from that treaty in 2019. And today we're talking about deploying a new category of hypersonic missiles into Germany that can strike Moscow within five minutes of being launched. Now, these aren't nuclear weapons, but read, Mos read Russia's nuclear posture. They say that if you strike our leadership in a decapitation strike, even if it's done with conventional weapons, we will automatically fire everything we got against the whole world. It's over. And they've also said that we will launch on detection, meaning we're not going to wait for the missiles to actually hit us. As soon as we detect the missiles being launched, we hit the button. So we're putting weapons in Germany this summer that can hit Moscow in five minutes. And if there's a mistake, an accidental firing or a radar blip goes off in Russia where they misconstrue a launch, they're going to hit the button. And when they do, the world's over. Done. What kind of insanity is this? What kind of world do we live in where people actually think this is sound policy? It's not. So, you know, this is much larger than just Russia's grievance against Ukraine or Russia's grievance against NATO. This is about all of mankind. And we need to come to an understanding as a people here in the United States that our government is carrying out policies in our name that deny our children and our grandchildren any hope of existing. Not just us. I mean, we're old people. Let us go away. We broke the world. You know, but we got a new generation out there that might be able to fix this world. We got to give them a chance. But we can't give them a chance when we're deliberately creating the conditions of global demise. And I hate to be negative, but that's where I stand on that. Well, you know, I'd like, I'd like I'll, to add to that what Scott said, Peter, and Peter, that is, hold, and what Joe said. Yes, Peter, hold yes, your thought because our time is up. Oh no! Okay. <laughs> Sorry, Peter. So we will we will continue this conversation right now. You've been listening to Joe Lombardo, um, Bethlehem Neighbors for Peace, uh, Scott Ritter. Um, uh, uh, the former weapons inspector and D Dr. Peter Cookson. And we will continue this conversation. And I thank you guys because this has been enlightening. So you've been listening to Issues That Matter. I'm Cynthia Pooler. If you like this show, subscribe to my YouTube page. Hey guys, we'll talk we'll talk soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.